Ahem. Hello, everybody. Welcome to... Nah. Do you remember French? I know, I know, weird question, right? As we all know, French was that obscure language spoken hundreds of years ago. Nobody speaks it anymore. Not many people talk about it these days, and for good reason, right? That's why today we're going to be discussing a much more important language that I'm sure you are all well aware of. That, of course, being the beautiful tongue that descended from the heathenry that was French. For example, we have the French word, Javon, which of course means I adore, I love, right? With its modern equivalent, Javon. So, you could see the similarities pretty easily right there. Now, how about a name? This was a very common name in France long ago. Pronounced something along the lines of Dominique. I'm not an expert on the way French was once spoken, so forgive my uh, mispronunciations. Of course, Dominique becomes the modern equivalent, Dominique. Then, of course, we have a phrase. This is a very common phrase in French long ago. To make everything into cheese. Of course, that becomes the modern, Fond de fond, which means to make a big fuss out of something. And thus, I introduce you to... C'est bon Raoul. Or, as we typically call it in English, Ultra French. The modern tongue, C'est bon Raoul. I mean, C'est bon. C'est bon Raoul. The consonants are, of course, B, B. Da, na, fa, va, na, sa, za, fa, va, sha, sha, ja, ha, ha, ra, ya, ya, ha, ra, ha, ya, ya. Very simple stuff. Oh, except that's not all. Because we also have. <laughs> <laughs> because we also have the raw colored fricatives, such as And of course in the orthography that that all ends up being written as such So you'll be seeing a lot of apostrophes a lot of double R's a lot of apostrophe H's Etc and a lot of acutes on top of consonants as you can see down at the bottom if it has yeah, an acute symbol going over and it's also a fricative, that means that it is one of the colored fricatives. The vowels look like this. E, N, U, U, N, E, N, O, E, E, N, O, A, O. Simple, right? Except that's not all of them. Because not only do we have nasalized vowels in Ultra French, but we also have nasal vowels. You see the ones with two tildes going over them? Those ones are nasal. They are released nearly entirely by the nose. Not nasalized, but nasal. So in this case, we have a three-way distinction in several of the vowels. E, N, and N. Don't forget, that's also not it. <laughs> that's also not all, because you also have the devoiced vowels. Now, Ultra French isn't an extremely popular language on the world stage, but amongst the linguistics community, it's fairly well known. So, I asked members of the Agnishwa Discord server to submit audio of them reciting this simple Ultra French sentence. Ooh, yeah. And the results were, uh, interesting. Le 
Ah, 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 we can, you see, detect rays and beams of energy floating between speakers of the ultra-French language if we use certain systems of measurement long forbidden. We still don't understand, however, the composition of these emissions. I don't know if that's actually true. Anyway. Obviously, even our linguistically minded crowd seems to have a hard time understanding the intricacies of this well-known language, thus necessitating the need for this presentation on some of the easy basics of the ultra-French language. Moving on, the orthography, as you can see in terms of the vowels, there's a few complexities. Um, it's mostly self-explanatory. A, a couple things you might want to notice are that a lot of the time the nasal vowels are written with carons over them instead of acutes and um, the oral or voiceless schwa are both spelt with a letter E. No acute, no caron, just simple. That of course leads us to the final little bit. If you didn't notice from the tables going through before, there are a couple little bits of ambiguity. The letters that are used in Ultra French do not entirely uh, equate one to one with the phonology. For example, like we just said, the letter E with no acute or anything on it uh, could represent E or a, uh, either voiced or voiceless. Of course, we have a single tilde, it can mean E or E, and then a grave could mean a normal E or a voiceless E. Right? And then we have the letter L, of course, and then that is one of the most annoying ones right there. The letter L could either be the phoneme or the phoneme. So keep that in mind. And this, it, the, the way that it appears it is ambiguous in terms of the letter itself, but most of the time the context of the word will let you know what it's meant to be. Though a lot of the time it's just memorization. And, of course, the letter C could either be used for H or the voiceless palatal, <laughs> the voiceless palatal glide. <laughs> so, word final voiceless A and schwa are actually, <laughs> are actually both just a voiceless schwa, and thus are both spelled with E with a dot under it. Now, furthermore, E can never occur word initially, so word initial is also just spelled with E with a grave, right? <laughs> just another little asterisk to consider there. Now, how did all of this happen? If we take a look at the 39-page uh, long intensive grammar of Ultra French, um, you can see in the phonological evolution section that a lot, a lot happened to get it to this point. Now, of course, there are linited forms of most of the consonants and for diachronic reasons da and ba can be linited in two different ways which lenition is used depends on the word <laughs> in grammatical material a dot below is used for the hard d and b which diachronically derive from t and pa in pseudo french for example there are nasalization patterns like this then we move on to the cases. So, there's a lot of cases in Ultra French. How many is that? There are 13 cases in Ultra French, and all of these are derived from prepositions that existed in Pseudo French. We're gonna start it out simple now. So, we're gonna be getting into some glosses after this. And just to, uh, just to make things a little smoother, to save some space, you should know that by default, verbs are active, present, and indicative, and nouns are singular and definite. It's going to be helpful for, for later. So, for example, we have this phrase, J'avons et fin, which means, I love the table, which glossed looks like this. So it's a lot easier to just write it like this. In that sentence that we had above, we have the word tant, which means table. Now, if we wanted to make that genitive and indefinite, then the word suddenly becomes final. As you can see, 
lenition has been applied to the D, and the genitive indefinite marker has been placed on the word, making it have the meaning of a table. But if that becomes plural, suddenly the word looks a little bit different. Sifan, right? The th has returned here. And that is because of the behavior of the plural in this situation. The genitive indefinite plural does not nasalize. On to adjectives. So most adjectives are actually adjective verbs. Adjectives are not declined and they follow the noun that they qualify. For example, here is the verb to be small or verb. Once we put it into the participle form, being small, the word is verb. In order to say the phrase something along the lines of of a small table or of a small being table, which is hard to translate into English, but that is probably the closest we can get. You would have the phrase Now, a comparative adjective would look something like this. Which means smaller and also small. Or if it's smaller but it's itself is not small, then we have well, then we have a comparative that does not mention the size of something. So, since they're adjective verbs, we can also put pronouns onto this and make it into essentially an entire sentence. So this sentence here, we are smaller, but not small. So we have a real complete sentence now. And you can see how the parts of the adjectival verb fit in to this overall sentence. So in the sentence, the fish was too bulky to swim to the surface, or <laughs> So in order to better understand what we just witnessed with that first full sentence there, we gotta start looking at some of the more complex features of ultra French grammar. Now, first of all, um, we have some very special active and passive morphological aspects. Now, there's a whole table, as you can see, of how these things fit in, right? We have the singular and plural distinction, and we have the persons, determining whether a verb is in the active voice or the passive voice. You have the basic verb in the infinitive form, avant, which means to love or adore. And then we have the active first person singular, zano, which means I love. Again, looks pretty similar to the ancestral language. But then we have circumfixed around this verb, which means you, plural, love. And then for a passive situation, the passive first person singular would be which means I am loved. If we put both of them together, the order matters significantly for the case in this situation. So as you can see, we have the circumfixed second person plural going around the verb with the first person singular passive sitting on the inside acting as a bit of an accusative situation here. Now, this is incorrect, right? Because you can't stick this passive prefix on the outside of these active voice second person plurals. Then, <laughs> We have a reflexive construction using this logic, which is which is you love yourselves. Pretty self-explanatory. Get it, self? Then we have, oh, <laughs> then you can re-infinitivize clauses and turn it back into a verb that contains the passive pronoun, any of the passive pronouns. In this situation, we have the infinitive verb, which means to love me. And then we have a passive infinitivized form. So this would be to be loved by you. And the infinitive passive marker is this en. So we have en baron. We have another verb here. Donner. For endow. Now, a dative construction using this framing. As you can see, the dative follows the suffix of the circumfix, adding in yet another element here. We have the morpheme for the third person neuter passive. We endow you with it. Bring 
even more into here, <laughs> we, have, we have this very simple, very beautiful sentence that puts it into the future tense, and even more, putting it into the conditional mood, we have, we would have endowed you with it. And adding even more, just when you think it couldn't even get better, it could, it is, here it is, putting it into the optative, which means, if this is like, you can't even translate this into English properly. This is like, beyond anything that we can perceive, but it's something along the lines of, if only we had endowed you with it. Like, it, it is, we would have endowed you with it, but now it is, if only we would have endowed you with it. Or something along the lines of that. Hopefully you understand. Something like that. Then, to make the whole thing negative, if only we had not endowed you with it, adds the negation marker. Now, there are multiple ways to negate things in this language. This is just one of them. Ah, uh, yeah, so let's let's consult this full 39-page grammar document to take a closer look. If we take a look at this lovely 39-page full and intensive grammar of modern ultra-French, which will be available on na.org shortly after this video comes out. Now, there's a lot of ha that happens in the allophony, and you can look at that on your own, because I do not think that I got it very right in the translation. Anyway... I didn't say that. Here we have a series of examples of the um, of the of the word table. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so for the comparative adjective, this is what we call them. We call them the affirming comparative for the thing that is better and also good, and the denying comparative, which means it's better but it's not good, and of course the neutral comparative, which does not make any statement about the positive in relation to um, the general standard, essentially. Let's talk for a second about tenses. So tense in Pseudo-French is marked by additional sets of affixes that are appended to the verb in addition to the active and passive affixes. Now, there are two broad groups of such affixes. There are suffixes, which are appended to the end of the verb and replaced with the active first plural, second person plural suffixes in those persons, as well as circumfixes and prefixes, which are inserted before the active passive markers and replace the active first plural, second plural suffixes in some cases. We have the present anterior and preterite, which, yeah, so those are different things. Those are different aspects here. Okay, table seven below lists the suffixes for those tenses. The present anterior has a perfect or perfective aspect, while the preterite has an imperfective aspect. The former is commonly used to describe events that are completed or extended to the present, particularly events that occurred recently, hence the name, while the latter is used to describe events that are ongoing or habitual, which is, you know, if you know anything about linguistics, that is actually pretty much the opposite of how it generally works. But in this situation, it, if, if you think about it, it makes sense for these terms to be the ones that are used. I'm not going to go into it. There are also two future tenses. So we have the future anterior and the conditional, right? Now these are formed by adding prefixes to the present forms. The prefix is the same in all persons and numbers, except that there is a separate prefix for the infinitive form. Again, remember, every single one of these tenses has an infinitive form in both its active and passive forms. So, in the future, much to the ultra-French learner's dismay, this prefix can go in between two separate positions, either before the person markers or in between the person markers and the stem. That's what we saw in the example. The former case is more common in speech, but the later is more literary and strongly preferred in writing and poetry as well as in formal speech. But even in very informal speech, the future one alone will still not be enough to get by, as the conditional, a very common tense, is formed using the future two. So here you can see it. All the many, many forms that this could take. Beautiful. Absolutely. The, the language of romance. And then we have the future two, which is fairly straightforward. It's essentially the conditional. 
And then even though future to generally operates as a conditional, we also have conditional tenses. Now, one last thing that is extra important to know about are these two forms that you'll see in the glosses of this language a lot. Um, or, or really just conceptually in the language, which are ACIs and PCIs. I'm just gonna read this out because this is important. So the term ACI is Latin for accusativus con infinitive, which means accusative with infinitive. As the name would suggest, this grammatical construction consists of a dependent clause formed by an accusative noun together with an infinitive. So the noun is the subject or object of the clause, and the infinitive is the predicate. This construction is most well known from classical languages such as Latin or Ancient Greek, but is also found in various other languages, including English and, of course, Ultra French. So, in the sentence above, Charles ordered a bridge to be built. The matrix clause is Charles ordered, and the dependent clause is formed by the ACI a bridge to be built. Since a bridge is the object in this case, the passive infinitive is used. Now, Ultra French does not have a word for that, as in I think that or I know that. Instead, it uses these ACIs in these cases. Now, if you remember the case table, there was a partitive case, and we didn't really talk about what that meant, but that comes into much more importance here. It's really common in Ultra French. So, in addition to ACIs, Ultra French also has PCIs, which use the partitive case instead. The partitive generally indicates that an action is incomplete, and thus PCIs can be used to express something similar. For instance, in this phrase, Charles ordered to start building a bridge. Again, rough English translation. A somewhat literal translation of this sentence would be something along the lines of Charles ordered the building of a bridge to be started. Then we have our numbers. While at first glance this may look classic in base 10, you need to keep in mind how pseudo-French once counted its numbers once things got a little bit larger into the tens place. And then 20 is... But as you can see, now we have 20, 21, of course, but then 30 is as in 20, 10, that's the number 10 right after that. So 30 is 20 and 10, and then that is 20 plus 11. And that goes all the way on up to 40, which is which means two twenties, right? 50 is then two twenties plus 10. 60 is, is three twenties. 70 is three twenties plus 10. 80 is four twenties. 90 is four twenties plus 10. And then we get to 100, some. And if you look at this dictionary, you can see the vast collection of phrases and idioms from Pseudo-French that evolved into some modestly polysyllabic words. And of course, at the very end, we have our lovely dictionary. Very intensive dictionary. And as you can see, some of the words are pretty simple and some of them, oh, oh they could get pretty tasty many of them originating from common phrases back in the pseudo-French days. Like this one, which originally meant, which originally was spoken as this entire phrase, to judge based on appearances, etc. Some of them can get pretty intense. And of course we have beauties like this one right here. Individual verb here, this is the root that will have all those other things appended to it, keep in mind. This verb, now this means to depend on predictions of the future. Its origin is generally disputed, first attested in the works of the early ultra-French comedian J.A.B. Snuff. 
this thing is a is a beautiful beautiful nightmare i strongly encourage all of you to go and read this entire document for yourselves once it's out on the website because i am not even going to be able to do justice to everything that this language miraculously manages to fit so beautifully and naturalistically <laughs> into its uh, true glorious nature it's time to read a small piece of famous ultra french literature on se voit bien ici, si on va dire, des renvoncions, des ambitions, si on y en a sans cesse. Oh god. Oh, kill me. Les sions, les sions, les sions, les sions, les sions. Ach, t'y qu'il tiesse. Sans en de t'y siesse. Dieu merci. Le rôle, la cidire, il y a moi, il est soir de sa fille en haut. Transition, il sur du film, il descend. On a fait le vase, il descend, soir. Il va sur le ciel en droit. Si je vois le rôle, il s'inscrit. Et droit nul, en grand séva, en cuir, de finistre, en se vend grand, du cidre, fils, mais du divorce qu'on voit, et le sens fruit, c'est en haut, si rail, en cuir, c'est ce qu'on voit, et l'immense ignorant, dis, des cibles, des rêves, la guerre, en voit, et le roc, il crée L'arbre, Roy du Nord-Sud, l'arbre, son sera de moi fournir à de moi les livres. Le grand grand vivant, un grand droit, il se vend et rouille. Come on, à voir, à voir, à voir, à à voir, il reste de rendre mon écrivain. Oh, and that's it. Oh my god. Merci au revoir. Or, thanks for watching. Holy shit. And that concludes the main body of our presentation. So, typically, most of the forensic research into these very real languages is pretty equally shared, though this time I have to say that Eternal was by far the main researcher. I merely brought together this extremely factual presentation of all the research for you. So shed the accolades on Eternal for being one of the most educated scholars in ultra-French linguistics and literature, and its descent from that French thing. Thank you all for joining us on this delve into Ultra French, and if you are confused about the level of self-awareness here, that sample text was the original Ultra French Reddit copypasta. So, yeah, I'm sure other people have done something like this in the past, but hey, it had Ultra in the name, which is pretty close to Hyper, so of course we had to throw our hats into the ring at some point on this. So, I hope you enjoyed. The full grammar will be available on the.org soon, and that link will be in the description as soon as that is the case. So, this video is hopefully coming out within a day or so of the main deadline for the second Cursed Conlang Circus. So, if you still haven't finished yours, uh, go check out that announcement video from two months ago so you know what to submit and how to submit it. Video. 
submit it as a video. As of me recording this, there's currently over 50 video submissions, which is like insane. Last year there was like 36 total, so we're at 50 plus right now, which is like, oh my god, <laughs> it's gonna be an enormous video. Um, yeah, so get, get ready for a good time on that one. And me in the future, have fun editing that. And uh, finally, thanks to my lovely patrons who support me through my wacky journeys in linguistics and conlang and provide memes and ideas that get me through this whole thing. They have already seen the first few pages of chapter two of Jojawa Joror, you know, my comic that takes place in the world where Autojun and Pitham and Permachikin and all that are spoken. So if you want that early access, go become a nature. There's also the secret Discord chat. There's all that stuff. Also, Eternal has a Patreon too. Since he's behind like all the technology, he's do he does the website, the Discord server, and of course, this monstrosity that you just witnessed was significantly created by him. So if you want to support him his way, that's fine too. Yeah, that's pretty much all I got. I will see y'all next time. Nah. Is. Out. Or as they say in ultra French. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, bye. <laughs>